in today's video, we're talking science. What's up YouTube? Welcome to the video. My name is Tyler, also known as the Fit Chemist, and I help young men take control of their fitness, nutrition, and lifestyle habits so that ultimately we can lead healthier and happier lives. So if you're new here, welcome. Please consider subscribing. Turn those notification bells on so you don't miss when I post new videos. And if you are returning, welcome back. I'm so glad that you are here. How often do you hear someone make some ridiculous claim followed by, trust me bro, I did my research. Like, what does that even mean? Did you watch a Netflix documentary? You watched a YouTube video? Maybe you saw something on Instagram that your cousin sent you or who knows, but I hate to break it to you. But unfortunately, that does not count as research. I know I mentioned YouTube in there and I just wanna point out that yes, I'm honest when I'm covering the studies that I do and I always put the references down in the description box below. But to be honest, I could lie to you. I could put up a screenshot, some paper, make a ridiculous claim afterwards. And if you don't go and verify that for yourself, then you ultimately don't know what I'm saying is true. Unless you were the person that was in the lab who formulated the hypothesis, decided what research methods you're gonna use to actually test that hypothesis, gathered all the data, wrote your findings up into a nice organized paper, submitted that to a journal for publication, get the editor's comments back, run subsequent experiments, and then resubmit, and then hopefully get accepted into that journal for publication, then no, you did not do the research. Technically what you did was research someone else's research. I realize that not everybody is a researcher, but the next best thing that you can do is become scientifically literate. And what does that even mean? Well, there was an article published by Howell and Brosser in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that was looking specifically at scientific literacy, and I think they broke it up nicely into three specific categories, and those categories are civic, digital, and cognitive. Civic is understanding how the people and the institutions conduct their research. Digital is how the media and online platforms distill that information to you, the consumer. And then cognitive is how you process all of that information as the consumer. So I'm not gonna go through everything they talk about in this article, but in my opinion, there are four major questions that you need to know how to answer or how to do in order to consider yourself scientifically literate. The first of those is where or how to actually find those studies. The second is going to be the different types of studies that there are and how those stack up against each other, or in other words, the hierarchy of scientific literature. The third one would be how to actually read a research article and take the results from that and apply it to the real world. And and the fourth one would be, do you have an understanding of the field as a whole? And that's gonna require you to stay up to date on the literature. So how do you even do that in the first place? I believe this is the best way because ultimately I'm gonna teach you how to get rid of that middleman, the digital scientific literacy, and teach you how to actually get back to the roots of where that science came from. So hopefully after watching this video, you feel well equipped on how to become informed about a particular topic of interest. I wanted to say how to do your own research there, but we've already discussed that. You're not doing your own research, right? You're researching someone else's research, but you get the point. With that, let's get into it. So let's start with where to find the studies. Well, hopefully if you are reading an article online or a blog post or something to that effect, you can scroll all the way down to the bottom and they will list those references for you. If they don't, you probably shouldn't trust anything that that article is saying. If you're already reading a peer reviewed article, those references will 100% be at the end. So if you're reading it online, scroll down to the bottom, or if you're reading a hard copy, all you have to do is flip to the end, you'll see the reference section, and then they should list the article title, the authors, and then often a citation. So that way all you have to do is take that citation, put that into Google, and you should be able to find that article. If you're watching a YouTube video, then hopefully the content creator has put them in the description box like I do. Again, if they don't do that, I probably wouldn't trust that source. If you're on social media, then a lot of times what you'll see is people will screenshot the paper and they'll put that online. So all you have to do is look up the title or what people will frequently do is include something called a PubMed ID in the Instagram caption. And what that ID is, is just a numerical value or a numerical identifier for that particular article. If you see something like this on Instagram and you wanna find that article, all you have to do is go to pubmed.gov and then enter in that numeric value and it will take you directly to that article homepage. And then you can click on the website or the journal that hosts that and you can actually find the full text. I think that those three are probably the most common method that people are gonna find their research. But outside of that, you can look at something like a research database, 
So you can go to Google Scholar or another one that I like is the DOAJ and that is the Directory of Open Access Journals. And if something is open access, that means that it's free to the public and not behind a paywall. So any article that you find on that research database will be free for you. I'll put a link down in the description box that lists the top 10 research databases. So if you don't like either of those two, then hopefully there are eight other options for you. If you truly wanna be scientifically literate, then I would also argue that what you should be doing is going directly to the journals themselves and paying attention for when new articles of that topic are published so you can stay up to date on the literature. I'll talk about this a little more later on, but down in the description box below, you can find a link that will take you to a website that ranks all of the top journals in terms of fitness, nutrition, and exercise. These journals are ranked by something called an impact factor or an SJR score. So an impact factor is the number of citations over the last two years in that journal divided by the number of articles that journal published. I think an SJR score is quite similar, except it's over a three-year period instead of a two-year period, but what I want to point out is that a higher impact factor means that there are more citations per article in that journal. So ultimately what that means is a higher impact factor means that research is being widely spread and it has a high impact. Notice there's one thing that I did not include in here and that is a Netflix documentary. So although they are quite entertaining, those are not a good place for getting your research. So I'm not aware of any footnote section on Netflix that you can just go in and click and see all the references. And I feel like in a best case scenario, the director has a website and they list all of their references and you can go and find those. But honestly, I'm not totally aware of people even doing that in the first place. So if you're someone who gets your research from Netflix documentaries and then you insist on sharing that with others, stop that. Stop it right now. The next thing that we need to know is the hierarchy of scientific literature, or in other words, how studies compare to one another. You have to understand that in science, just because one study is published, that does not mean that it is the end all be all and a definitive answer to a particular hypothesis. What's important is that other researchers can see the work that you did, and then they can also test that hypothesis with their own research methods, and hopefully they come to the same conclusion that you did, and that further validates that particular area of research. After numerous studies are published on a particular topic, they are often organized into what's called a systematic review or a meta-analysis. And these are the highest tier of scientific articles that you can read because ultimately what they're doing is they're taking all those individual articles and they're putting them into one nice place that you can read and get a general consensus on that topic. For that reason, if we look at this diagram of the hierarchy of scientific evidence, we can see that systematic reviews are sitting right at the top. So again, a systematic review essentially just pools and summarizes the data from each individual study and then they include it in the review. A critically appraised topic is just an appraisal of clinically relevant studies. So in other words, it's pretty much just a one page summary of a systematic review. A critically appraised individual article is an article that's selected and rated for clinical relevance by physicians. So essentially just taking one article that they think is impactful and just making a practical suggestion on how to actually apply that. A randomized control trial is a study wherein the subjects are divided into two groups, one that received the treatment and one that receives a placebo. Cohort studies are studies that compare outcomes between two groups studied over a period of time. And then case reports are reports on the treatment and outcome of a single patient. So this is sort of anecdotal evidence. Oftentimes in fitness and nutrition, you'll see those randomized control trials or cohort studies. And again, those are just individual studies and those get summarized into the systematic reviews and meta-analyses. The point that I'm really trying to drive home here is that systematic reviews are gonna be the best thing that you can look for. Because remember, one study does not give you the big picture. We need to look at the data as an aggregate and see what the general consensus is. One other thing you may have noticed about that diagram is that on the bottom, it says expert opinion. And chances are you are probably not an expert in this field, which means that your opinion is even lower than the bottom of the bottom. We'll talk about how to actually read a scientific study in just one second but my question of the day for you guys since i'm so used to this stuff did you find this video helpful and is there something that you learned let me know down in the comments below but with that let's get back into it before you actually read the article it is important to know how studies are broken up so to start, we have the title of the article and the authors listed below, and oftentimes the institutions where they reside or where they conducted this research. After that, you'll see the abstract, which is just a summary of the key findings, maybe in like four to five sentences. But again, it doesn't really give you the big picture. It's just a very short snippet of that research. Then there's an introduction section where they talk about the relevance of this research and maybe demonstrate some of the previous results in this field. Then there's a research methods section, which they talk about the actual methods that they use to conduct this research. 
After that, there will be the results. So what were their findings from this study? After that, there's a discussion section, which they talk about the meaning of those results, how to actually apply it into the real world. They talk about some limitations of their study and then maybe some future studies and what they plan on doing with the results of this research. After that, you'll find the acknowledgement section, which typically lists the funding sources and then also some people that may have contributed to the research, but aren't necessarily authors on the paper. And then lastly, there's gonna be the reference section. My number one tip is do not just read the app abstract of the paper. Yes, it is a nice summary of the key findings, but it doesn't give you any of the details of that actual research. We can take a look at one of the articles that I recently covered in a video talking about hypertrophy and rep ranges. And if I scroll through this, you can see that there are highlights all over this thing because when I'm reading it, I'm actively engaging in the research, asking myself questions, trying to understand what it is the authors are telling me while I am going through the paper. Some good questions to ask yourself while you're going through the paper are who conducted this research and who funded it and how might that impact the results of this study? When talking about the research, do they acknowledge any limitations to this study or their own work? And if not, it's your job to come up with what those limitations might be. When was this study published and how does it compare to more recently published work on this particular topic? And then lastly, how can I apply this information in the real world? Now you are equipped on where to actually go and find those studies, the hierarchy of scientific literature, so how those studies compare to one another and how to actually read the study itself, but to become fully scientifically literate, I would say that you do have to stay up to date on the current literature. So how do you do that? I would recommend that you sign up for an RSS feed like Old Reader. So essentially think of taking your Facebook homepage and then just making something like that, but only for research. So what you can do is go to oldreader.com, sign up using your email, and then after that, what you wanna do is just go to a particular journal's website, take the URL, paste it into Old Reader, and then all you do is click subscribe, and it will take all of the articles that are published on that journal's website, and it will put them into this Old Reader feed. So let's say you sign up for 10 different journals, instead of having to go to all 10 of those journals, you just go to the Old Reader and you'll see all of them are sort of compiled quite nicely in a nice timeline for you. One thing that I wanna point out with RSS feeds is that it also does work with websites. So if you subscribe to different blogs, maybe something like Stronger by Science, which isn't an actual journal, but they still publish high quality content, you can go to Stronger by Science website, copy and paste that URL into Old Reader, and then from there you can subscribe to all the articles that they publish on that website. Another thing too is that Old Reader is kind of outdated in terms of their user interface. So one that I'm aware of that's a little bit more modern is called Feedly. So you can go ahead and try that out. If you do, let me know in the comments down below. I use Old Reader just because I'm used to it. Something else you can do is follow people on social media who are actually conducting the research. So a lot of times what they'll do is when they have a new article that they published, they'll post that online to social media. So whether that's on Twitter or Instagram, I know for the chemistry world, Twitter is like a huge thing. As soon as someone publishes a new article, it's blasted all over Twitter. I'm not so sure about fitness and nutrition, but there are a lot of good people that you could follow on Instagram that can point you to this research. I noted a couple of them on my phone. So what I'll do is I'll just like put their profile and a little phone template over there and you can go ahead and follow them on Instagram if you want. But the first one would be Lane Norton or BioLane, Brad Schoenfeld, Alan Aragon, Menno Henselmans, Greg Knuckles, Chris Beardsley, or Eric Helms. So all these people actually conduct research themselves or they are frequently involved in that community and they post stuff about that research. But again, it's gonna be your responsibility to go from social media to actually finding that research and reading it yourself. Lastly, if you need a place to store all these references, I would recommend checking out an app called Mendeley. So they have a desktop and a mobile client, but essentially what this allows you to do is save those PDFs or those research articles upload them into Mendeley. You can access them anywhere with your phone or your computer. And then in the app itself, you can read the articles, you can highlight, you can annotate, you can export as various citation styles. Like honestly, this is a great resource and I'm so thankful that I found it early in my graduate career. Cause if I didn't, I'm pretty sure that I would be spending about half of my time writing my thesis, going back and trying to find those references in the first place. All right, guys, that's gonna be it for today's video. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Let me know in the comments down below. And again, if you're new here, here, be sure to subscribe, turn those notification bells on because I post new videos every single Friday and you do not want to miss when they go live. And with that, I'll see you in the next video.